Okay, good morning. It's Friday, January 15th, 2021. And I'm Janice Clay, the chair of the Civic Caucus, a Minnesota nonprofit dedicated to thoughtful nonpartisan debate and discussion of issues important to Minnesota. Today, we will be interviewing Clarence Shalbetter, who will lead us through a discussion of the important and significant work and a lot of work done by the Citizens League some decades ago on the topic of Minneapolis city charter reform, much still relevant today. I'm joined by fellow members of the Civic Caucus interview group. Lee Munich will be chairing our meeting today and Paul Gilgey will lead off by introducing Clarence. Take it away, Paul. Clarence Schaubetter is probably the best person equipped today to describe for us a unique idea that the Citizens League came up with in the whole battle over the structure of Minneapolis city government and the power struggles between the city council and the mayor coming up with a new idea. And that idea is still on the table today and we're so anxious to hear from Clarence about it. Now Clarence himself has a distinguished record in the Citizens League as a staffer for more than 10 years, also a staffer for the Metropolitan Council and for the Minnesota House of Representatives but not just the public policy concept with Mr. Schalbetter. He, several years ago, made a decision to become a deacon in the Catholic Church. And in his work, every single Sunday, Clarence Schalbetter finds himself at the Hennepin County Detention Center talking with young boys who are troubled. How many of us would do that? But Clarence does that on a regular basis. And I think we are immensely grateful to the kind of dedication that he is showing. He is, of course, a lot younger than many of us around this thing. <laughs> so he has been many more years than, than we have. But, but it, it, is, it is an astounding uh, kind of uh, development. So I, I can't think of anybody else better qualified than Clarence. I'll be looking today to see if I could pick up the single nugget that needs to get pushed to the city members who are working on charter reform to accomplish the idea of getting up on the table what the Citizens League had to say. Go, go to it. Okay. Well, thank you, Paul. I, uh, I, it's a very generous introduction, but I also want to welcome both you, Paul, as well as Ted, who's with us, to break in on any part of the presentation I'm making because they were very involved and very active in this uh, activity that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, Ted at the time was the executive director of the Citizens League and Paul was its research director. So they're very familiar with what in fact uh, we were saying and how we got to what we were saying. I wanna suggest at the very outset here that we'd like to focus initially on the work that was done, how it was done, what it came to conclusions about and then what its recommendations were, and finally, uh, how they got implemented. Uh, the, and I'd like to in, in suggest I break this into about four parts, uh, but I'll do it by piece, and then I'll invite anyone to ask questions about the content of the, or the topic that I'm talking about at the time. So to lead off, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Citizens League and the study process that many years ago it was engaged in doing, and it used this study process on a large number of topics. Uh, it was pretty, it found that this process was helpful, insightful, and useful to bringing out some deep understanding of a number of topics, and then uh, suggestions on what you could do to fix whatever the issue or problem was. The report on who will help us get action, give a a shot on what that looked like in the front cover. Who will help us get action is the name of the report. But the subtitle was a proposal to answer the appeal for political leadership in solving the problems confronting the city of Minneapolis. Now remember this was in 1969. The report itself was the product of 34 meetings starting in November of 1967 and until March of 1969. It was conducted by a 14 member committee of the Citizens League led by the deceased Jim Weaver. The list of members approved by the Citizens League board are noted uh, on the end of the report. And I'm beginning in this discussion 
really at the end of the report to give you some familiarity with what was going on. As a research director, I had just returned after four years in the Navy. And, uh, and, arranged, and I, as a research assistant, arranged for 19 speakers who were knowledgeable about the planning process in Minneapolis and about the structure of government. And, it, and in the process, I took some lengthy meetings of their presentations, worked with the chair, and functioned in general to uh, record what we were thinking and saying, and then finally producing the report itself. It was then approved by the Citizens League board, whose members are noted, as you can see in the screen. Uh, one of them included the wife of T. Williams, one of our esteemed members. The board itself had a program committee that was looking at possible topics for the Citizens League to explore. One of those they decided was this matter of the leadership of the city of Minneapolis in response to the problems and issues that face the city. But it had a very specific charge. It was on page 49. It said, we were to review the proposals since publication of the Ashman report in 1957, 10 years before the group, for the organization of planning and development by the city of Minneapolis. We were then to make recommendations for a more effective working relationship among the planning, capital budgeting, and public works activities of the city. So you can see the committee when it sat down already had before it the issue that the board thought we needed to begin to explore. And then we invited speakers in to get at various pieces of that. We finally were to make recommendations for more effective relationships between the city government and the independent agencies also carrying on development programs in Minneapolis, namely the Planning Commission, the Capital Long Range Planning Commission, the Board of Estimate and Taxation, and the newly expanded Coordinator's Office. The board went on to note that the committee was to examine the planning and development process that, organized, that operated at that time and consider whether changes will be feasible and desirable. This issue of what's feasible and desirable, I'll go into a some length revolved around the reality that earlier efforts to change the roles and responsibilities of the leaders of the city uh, had gone to defeat. And we knew that, and we had to figure out how do we, in the face of that turn down by the voters and a significant turn down, what do you do? And how do you create something that uh, can address the problems that you identified? So note that Number one, the committee was to understand how the planning function operated in Minneapolis, what issues were identified and what might be done about these. And number two, in doing this to consider whether changes will be feasible or desirable. So this is by way of background, what set the stage for this study by this group of people. Are there any questions about this Citizens League process? Because I think it's, it's important to understand what that's all about. Any questions? Uh, oops. Go ahead. Um, in uh, in the past, uh, from the Citizens League committees I was on, and you didn't mention this, it was important that the committee members be generalists and not those with special interests. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was uh, true, and I think that the Citizens League from the very very beginning had assumed that that's what they were looking at. Uh, it became an issue later on, not so much in this period, but later on it did become a real issue, and we had to go to much more selective kind of processes to make sure that the group who met were generalists. That is, they weren't the specialists, they weren't the professionals. It was a group of citizens who had broad interest and knowledge of government, but they wanted to know what they could do to sort through these issues and problems and come to recommendations without being overwhelmed by the group of people who felt they already knew what the answers were. So yes, you're right. This is a, an issue that the league had to deal with. Uh, and I don't recall that in that time, it was quite as acute as an issue as it became later on. Okay, Any other questions? Okay, now I'll go a little bit into the 
uh, content of the report itself. As I've noted in the beginning, it really did focus on this question of city development. The committee had been made aware of the development decisions faced by the city historically that had captured the decisions nearly 40 year, have decisions uh, of every, about every 40 years in the development cycle of the city. In other words, this didn't just happen in time immediately. We recognize that the city had already evolved and gone through a number of phases of development. I can go into those in greater detail later on, but there are changes that occur about every 40 years from the initial settlement and frankly, the removal of all the structures from that initial settlement. And then a whole lot of things happen. And again, those get removed. And then we go to another cycle and the same thing happens. We've gone through about four of these kinds of cycles of development and redevelopment. We had done so with an organization of city, which was fairly simple in its very origins. Uh, the very beginning, you see basically the two functions of police and fire and, uh, and clean up the, uh, the urine and, uh, and uh, excrement covered the streets from the horses that carried people around <sighs> to the very real development, the massive hard development of the 1880s through about 1920 around the river, massive fires, uh, a lot of building to accommodate people, everything fairly close into that center of the city. And then it moves out and uh, we're left with what's there. And then the move out creates all new kinds of structures and new activities in the center. And finally, in the last phase, we were beginning to see the realities of suburbanization that was changing the image, the understanding of the central city and it poses all kinds of challenges to the central city, changing its image and trying to respond to the reality that it's part of a much larger whole. As a matter of fact, by 1969, the city of Minneapolis and its population really only was 14% of the total population of the seven county region. Mm. So we knew that, we came to realize that, and we had seen just fairly recently before that, a very large urban renewal program that cleared everything in what we called the lower loop. Everything from about 4th Street all the way to the river got cleared out from 1st Avenue North down to 3rd Avenue South. And rebuilding began to occur in that now cleared out area. I'm not going to talk, we could talk about the, how that was done and how the, the merits of it, but the point is that that's what we did because the consensus was this area was blighted. This area was full of dilapidated buildings. We needed to clear it out and start over again. And the federal government had a very generous urban renewal program that it fully funded. And it cost the city very little of direct funds to do this. It set up another separate agency called the Housing Redevelopment Authority to do it, but it just moved to do it. Another aspect of what we came in to realize was that a number of functions that the city was performing and had done so, had been performing for years, uh, were becoming either too expensive or they were uh, facilities and activities that could no longer do by itself. The premier example of that was General Hospital. The city had built and run its own hospital, uh, considerable reputation to that hospital, trained a lot of doctors, but it was becoming very expensive and the facility was getting obsolete. And through a number of discussions, uh, and some legislation, that hospital was moved from the city of Minneapolis to the Hennepin County. And Hennepin County Medical Center now is the facility that replaced the old general hospital. In addition, we knew and saw that a number of companies that were very well known were already beginning to move out of the city. The best example of that was General Mills. Most of the open land that by the end of the war still existed in Minneapolis and South Minneapolis, the Southern edges and the Northern edges was getting filled in. There was no space, basically empty space, uh, old farms, nothing left to put buildings on. Almost all of the new homes, factories, uh, retailing facilities were going into the suburbs. And the suburban development was beginning to challenge much of what was going on in downtown Minneapolis. We saw the new uh, Southdale as an example, and then all the other Dales that were developed. 
uh, they began to really challenge and replace downtown Minneapolis as a center for retailing. And some of the reputable places people had gone for uh, almost a century uh, were now beginning to disappear. That included most obviously Dayton's, Donaldson's went up in flat flames, Powers, Young Quinlan, Harold's, all these big reputable and important uh, centers of retailing and centers of activity were disappearing, leaving the city. And that they, they weren't leaving, they were, they were leaving, they were going to find themselves in all these dales, but there wasn't anything left in downtown of any consequence in terms of retailing. We saw all that and could see that, but the city was responding to this set of competitive pressures and all, and they were investing in a number of uh, replacements for city facilities. We were beginning to rebuild or build new schools to replace old schools. Same thing was true of fire stations and sewers and streets. The streets were improving markedly. We were covering them. We had already covered them with oil uh, in an earlier development period. And now we're looking at the question of how do we systematically begin to put a harder surface asphalt on top of all the city streets in addition to uh, the arterial streets. At the time we met, the freeway system was well underway in terms of its location and the construction was underway. This was the new transportation arteries. The federal government had initially started with the thought that this was going to be a, a, a federal, federally funded, 90% federal funded system of wide roadways, un, uninterrupted, safe, and they were going to be built to connect the regions of the country. But the initial law thought was they were, on, they were going to just pick, they were going to serve these metropolitan areas by coming into the edge of them. There would be a circumferential route around them and then they would go on to the next one and it's circumferential. They were not intended to go into, hit the downtown sections of the city. But the cities all over the country said, hey, our downtowns need access from this freeway system. And so by the time we were meeting, they were still engaged in finalizing the locations of the pieces of this thing. I-394, for example, was added after everything else had been done and, and much of it had been built, all of a sudden the pressure came from the Western suburbs that said, you gotta connect us to downtown. So that freeway system was a real challenging uh, discussion and set of decisions that were being made. And what we have today, pretty much evolved from this earlier and earlier era and the era, era that we were talking about in, in this report. <coughs> but we went on to document not only the problems that were a consequence of this development cycle that was getting addressed, but we also noted that the city in 1957 had purchased uh, the time and energy, the thought of a nationally known consultant called Ashman and Associates. And that group came in and said, hey, you really need to, to update your planning function. Uh, you're, you're, you don't have a, a mechanism and a way of really systematically thinking about what's going on and what you should be doing about it. And we have been then responding as a city to what that's all about. How do you invest in how do you get a group of people who are planners to figure out what's going on now and what can you anticipate is going to happen in the future. So organizationally though we inherited a governance structure that frankly had again also accumulated over time. As I said before that governmental structure was fairly simple in the early origins of the city a lot of things kept getting added to what was known then as the, as the city's uh, charter. So that by 1920, uh, we had the first real addition of the city charter, but it really was an accumulation of all of the bits and pieces that had existed in the prior age. It, it heavily focused on the city council, which over time had been very simple, but had grown and grown and grown. And at one point, it had grown up to 26 members, all of whom were full-time. They had staff and it was unwieldy. We had hit, we, the terms of office had ranged all the way from the beginning of one year only 
to then two years, and then proposals for two and four years and back to two and back to four. So we were constantly shifting around this ever growing uh, center, at least it was seen by the community as the center called the city council. We did have this mayor uh, as a role, but it was largely a ceremonial function. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you want more coffee? It was largely a ceremonial function that the, that the mayor occupied. The mayor was, we found, located in his uh, attractive offices down on the first floor of the city county courthouse. A very large structure, uh, attractive structure, but it was, he was on the first floor. And the city council, which is where the action was, was up on the third floor. And they didn't necessarily have to talk to each other because he really didn't have an awful lot to do in the context of what the city council was acting on. His job was largely ceremonial. Who was the mayor then? At the time that this report was done? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I wanna say Stenvik. No. But, well, it could have been then. It was, I think it was Naftalin and Stenvig, Stenvig at that point. Right, right. Yeah, and so the mayor was, as I said, physically located on the first floor and the city council on the third floor. The report then discusses 11 issues that we identified that required leadership for their early resolution. You'll find those on pages two to six. And I'm not going to go into those in great deep depth, depth at this point, but they did include this location of the freeways. Um, and it included the fact that the transit system, which had been terribly important to the development of the city, which had been private in, in character and was fully financed from fares, had collapsed. It was deteriorating and it was financially no longer able to function. The private owner, went out of business and systematically the city proceeded to tear up all the tracks that had served most of the residential areas of the city and paved over the areas that had tracks in them. And the transit function then uh, in effect became public. The legislature said we'll make this a public function and we'll move it to a separate freestanding organization called the Metro Transit Commission. Uh, the city had to respond to what are we going to do now that this thing we call transit is markedly different it's going to be run it's going to be buses and not uh, streetcars uh it's not going to be owned by a uh, private organization but instead by the public sector and it's not going to be us it's going to be a now new regional organization that was another illustration of the kind of thing the arterial system had to be built to grow to accommodate a growing number of cars because automobiles were obviously the primary and preferred route of preferred way of travel. After World War II, explosion in the numbers of automobiles, uh, nearly every household had purchased an automobile and in part they needed because the growing number of jobs were not found in the city, close to home, they were found in the suburbs. So what you see is a lot of traffic and movement in out of homes in Minneapolis to jobs in the suburbs. At the same time, obviously, there still continues to be people in these some of these suburbs, growing suburbs that also find their jobs in downtown. So you have this much larger set of movements accommodated by, um, by uh, automobiles. Uh, the question of what happens to the uh, services that uh, accommodate people who live in all the homes in Minneapolis. These have largely been accommodated by local, very local uh, enterprises that were within a few blocks of where most people lived. There were lots of merchants on local streets, intersections of the old streetcar system produced uh, places where people did business and those businesses largely served the surrounding areas. Much of that fabric had been threatened at that point and the resulting streets of some consequence uh, were in stress. In South Minneapolis, Lake Street, Northeast, it was Central Avenue, and North Minneapolis is West Broadway. The, the, the income, the wealth of the people adjoining these areas made a significant difference 
to what happened to those areas as well. But we knew these things were happening and they needed the city to address them. Then the question was the revenue needs of the city and ways of financing them were increasingly a question. And we had decisions that needed to be made about uh, what, what issues that were arising needed to be resolved on a regional basis in, the, in a metropolitan basis and what social service policies needed to be adjusted or changed. And finally, the imminent question of the day was, what are we gonna do about combining the collection of trash and garbage and how are we gonna get rid of this stuff? Uh, there was a serious question in Minneapolis whether it could continue to use city employees only to pick up <laughs> and dispose of, of trash. And the city had to wrestle with how do, you, how do you sort that out and who should do what in that case? So the report then goes on any, any question at this point about these, these and other kinds of issues that the city had been wrestling with, and they knew that they were there because it was obvious, uh, but they were reality. Anybody wanna, John, you can- uh, you, you didn't mention the Nicollet Mall. I think that was okay. something too in that period. Yeah, no, that was, that, was, that was in part a response to what was going on in the suburbs. We had these, these investments in malls and the burbs and what could the city do to revitalize, attract uh, people to the downtown as the, as the retail section is, is collapsing. In a, in a, well, I won't go into, but later after the report, we've got a whole series of these kinds of things that, that continue to evolve and the city again had to respond to them. I would suggest that one of the ways the city responded was to realize it couldn't recapture uh, the old image that it had uh, as the center for all kinds of activities, but it made a determined effort to become the center for statewide, but certainly regional entertainment. Uh, and enormous investments were made by the city then in all kinds of arenas for baseball, football, basketball, uh, for, uh, for the, um, uh, the theater. For the orchestra. And the orchestra. The orchestra had been downtown, the Lyceum Theater, but that was an obsolete facility. And the investment was made with the support of a lot of uh, early wealthy people and the city to get a new orchestra hall built. So we became the center for some cultural, but especially athletic activities for the entire region and the state. But that's a, 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 that's a development that occurs really after this report. And, and tax increment financing, <laughs> I think that was in place or just starting at the time you did this. I even just, I don't know about no, when it started. Start. Tax exempt financing started in 1973. Yeah, that's, I thought that was later than that. <clears throat> so then the question is, so we saw all of these issues and we said, well, what is it that, that we have to do in response to the fact that there seemed to be a lot of confusion maybe not very strong response to a number of these questions. So the major conclusion of the report was that a politically identifiable leadership was required for many policies and decisions. Under the arrangement of the roles and responsibilities in what is known as that city charter, these responsibilities and authority were not connected. Instead, the mayor had the responsibility but lacked the authority. Whereas that 13 member city council elected from wards had the authority to make decisions, but it lacked the responsibility. It's the leader, its leader, the city council's leader known as the president of the city council often appeared to be the key decision maker and even the spokesperson for the city. Even though that person was not elected from the entire city, but represented a particular ward. He or she was elected by the majority of the uh, 13 member city council. And as I indicated earlier, there was even a physical separation between the mayor and the city council. The report then discusses 11 issues that require leadership for their early resolution. And I've talked a bit about all of those. So the report, goes on then to ask, where is the leadership role in the Minneapolis city government? It goes on for three pages to discuss the elements 
in this fragmented leadership function and the conflicts that often occurred between these elements that often revolved around planning, budgeting, and who acted as the spokesperson for the city. Our central conclusions are outlined on pages nine and 10. The report goes on in depth, some would say deeply into the weeds these days, uh, in trying to figure out what's going on with this planning function, which had grown, as I said, fairly significantly in response to this set of proposals from Frederick Ashman in 1956. And we saw what they were trying to do, and we looked at the capital uh, project uh, evolution, how the projects rose and how they got rated and uh, by a group called the Capital Long Range Com Planning Commission, and how the city council picked them up and just did them. They were often quite separate from other aspects of the planning uh, system. Some of the issues we said really the, the city was not paying attention to and hadn't done and hadn't done much to connect what the planners were coming up with was with actual policies. An example of that was parking ramps surrounding downtown. Planners had said you need to get some parking ramps because the major way that a lot of people in this region are going to get downtown is by automobile and you've got to accommodate them. Where do you build them? Do you build them in the center right next to the uh, offices and the retail centers, or do you build them on the periphery of the downtown? Others exam other examples um, uh, were the disconnect between planning and development as illustrated, as I said, in that capital budget and contrasted, the contrast was obvious between that function, that activity on the part of the city and its planning and redevelopment authority, which systematically just went after the process of acquiring, removing, and leveling and selling land in this large part of downtown Minneapolis. The council, which saw itself in control, moved, did respond by moving the planning function under a new office that had been created just a few years before called the city coordinator. And that city coordinator was becoming the chief administrator of the city. All of the city department heads were appointed by the city council uh, and the city council individual members could simply pick up the phone and call whomever in the planning in, in any one of these departments about anything that a constituent called about, whether it was a pothole, uh, a, a threat to themselves or a problem in, in any part of the city. They would just, they, they just got lots of questions or calls from their constituents it was a way in which they could connect to those constituents and be important in their lives. And that was the primary way in which a lot of, of departmental activity was ordered by the individual responses on the part of these individual council members. <laughs> the report finally then went into recommendations. If this is the situation you got, what should we do? And we, we recommended that the president of the city council, the offices of the president of the city council and the mayor be merged. Bring the two of them together. These two leadership, obviously somewhat public leadership functions should now be united in one office. And then we, did, then we began to weigh the merits and the values of various kinds of organizations. We knew about all of these because the Citizens League had been responsible almost at the very beginning of its existence in looking at the question of the city charter. How should we structure government? And the Citizens League before that had come to the conclusion as had the mayor of Minneapolis in 1948, Hubert Humphrey, we need to have a strong mayor who has all the responsibilities for administration and for all of the activities then that mayor would make recommendations to the city council, the city council would adopt them uh, or not and or modify them. And the mayor could veto any actions of this part of the city council. That kind of a proposal had gone down to defeat in 1948 when uh, Mayor Humphrey had proposed. The Citizens League through its study process had come up with a similar strong mayor uh, approach in 1962 
had gotten the city to put it on the ballot and it went down again by 60%. So that was the history. We knew that they had been defeated and significantly so. And the question is, how are you gonna do anything to fix this leadership question uh, if in fact the preferred way wasn't succeeding? I should note also that many years before in 1926, there were efforts underway to create a city manager system, but these were defeated by an even wider margin of 70%. The league also rejected, uh, reject, the league in this, in this study rejected the strong mayor option, even if it would provide dynamic citywide leadership. Hmm. Because it was fearful that if it came back to that and did too much to strengthen the mayor, it would be seen as trying to dominate the deliberative process and the decision-making process on the part of the city council. Oh. And the city, huh? Because, because it, would, it would seem to supersede uh, what in fact they were trying to do. They had been in charge of everything. And anytime you entered into this kind of thing, there was this, this rivalry that became apparent. And we said, can't we do something to begin to minimize this rivalry so that the uh, city council can't in effect continue to do what they were doing. They were even doing a lot of things that really bypassed the mayor. A lot of their committees were meeting and making decisions in what they called committee reports. And they were pretty significant decisions and they would just simply get adopted or not, but they never got sent to the mayor. The, the mayor didn't have anything to say about them. He just, just didn't even see them. They were just gone. So, and, and then finally it concluded that this new office or new, newer office, it wasn't brand new, but the newer office of this coordinator was important and should remain, but primarily as a chief administrator of the city. The league went on to recommend that the office of the mayor be strengthened and additional staff assistance be provided to it. It noted in particular that the mayor is the only citywide elected leader and it uh, considered uh, that by, um, by strengthening it, and it, and it, it, it thought for a while that maybe what we could do was have the coordinator appointed by the mayor, uh, maybe even have some of the department heads in addition to the police department. Uh, and maybe there should be a role for the mayor in the preparation of the budget, which he didn't have anything to do with and maybe even have a line item veto over appropriations. Um, However, again, it, rec it recognized all of this, but it came to the conclusion that some of these ways had already been rejected by the voters. And instead we concluded we should build upon the improvements and changes already made by the city council. The league also rejected the uh, proposal that uh, the president of the city council uh, continue as this recognized uh, leader for the city. It did see that this office um, was in and of the system and was able to sense often the politics of decision-making and it would share in the role of the spokesman for the city. As a consequence, the league concluded and recommended in the end that a way of addressing this was to simply begin to merge the two offices of the city president of the city council and the office of the mayor. Get the mayor out of that office on the first floor, get him back, get him up to the third floor and have him come into the city council and be present for the city council meetings. So he's more aware of what's going on. He's engaged, he can speak to those questions. He becomes much more visible in this process. We came to understand and called this now new leader, the citywide politically responsive leader, the CPRL. And we felt that this office would have many, uh, if we had that office, many of the conflicts that we had at the time would be eliminated. The policy leadership would rest with this citywide elected public official. And we noted that in the end, this new fabrication of leadership and this role was, some, was very much like what had already occurred in Hartford, Connecticut. 
Other responsibilities that would strengthen the leadership function included having the mayor identify problems, provide direction, and present the budget recommendations that he received from the city coordinator together with his comments to the city council. So he's to have an active function in the budget. No longer would it just come up with, re with uh, requests that were presented by the board of estimate and taxation to the coordinator and then the coordinator made recommendations directly to the city council. Instead, we said, no, that process of collecting, uh, looking at these things, making recommendations by the coordinator was fine, but we want the mayor to be able to speak to those budget priorities and those budget proposals. And then it goes to the city council. The uh, same thing was true of the capital budget. Uh, the league also recommended that this citywide leader be the official policy spokesperson for the city in the legislature. There would no longer be a city council only making recommendations to the legislature. The mayor is the person who would speak for the city and the mayor is the one who would present these to the legislature. And then the mayor would also continue to have, have these ceremonial functions of welcoming people to the city and giving attentions to completed, completed projects. Finally, the report recommended all actions of the city council, especially these committee reports and actions uh, that often stated city positions on various matters, such as, uh, for example, some of the questions about priority and timing of freeway development or the ordering, uh, uh, the ordering of plans for detailed drawings of the city auditorium and its schedule for financing, all of which had been done by committee reports of the city council and never sent to the mayor. All that would have to end and they would now be going routinely to the mayor for his approval or rejection. While the mayor might in this process become a voting member of the city council, this was done in many suburbs, uh, we felt that this was this was not going to be helpful in this process because it would probably also then require the addition of another city council member and another ward or the reformulating uh, of this process. Uh, that cumbersome system of many council members working full time in all of these wards uh, didn't need to be complicated by adding another one simply for the benefit of having the city uh, mayor trying to be uh, in effect the operating president of the city council. So the league then went on to recommend uh, some other changes in the planning function, the terms of the citizen members of the planning commission should be made coterminous with those of the office <laughs> of, of the mayor. So those were the essence of the proposed recommendations. Uh, merge that office of the city, uh, of the city council president and the mayor into one increase and significantly strengthen the role of the city mayor in the budgeting function and in the planning function. Uh, continue the mayor's role and ability to veto any actions of the city council, get all of the actions of the city council up to the mayor for his approval or disapproval and have the mayor as the spokesperson for the city. So any questions about the proposals at this point? I'll talk about the implementation then. Questions? As you were going along in that uh, study process, was the business community being involved uh, so that their eventual support would be significant or not? I think I think it's fair to say that was one of the one of the unique qualities of the Citizens League for many years, not just at that time, but for many, many years, there were many leaders of the business community who, if not themselves directly involved on the Citizens League, had people who worked for them in public affairs, for example, working on these committees. Many of them were represented on the board. Many efforts were made to go out and communicate with the leaders of the business community. So I think you have to say that the business community is aware of the fact that this group of citizens are really looking in depth 
at a set of issues that the city is struggling with. They knew they were struggling with these questions. Now the question is, how are you going to deal with them? And so they were made aware of it. And I think the Citizens League was getting directly and indirectly uh, indications of interest in, clearly interest in, and support from the business community. Hmm. I mean, uh, Ted can speak to this maybe much John better. Terrence, are you talking? You need to unmute. Who, me? Uh, well, I guess Paul Gilgey had his hand up. Paul, Paul would be able to speak. I want to talk. I have a question. Right. I'd be curious. Uh, what would you say the main argument that people make who like the present decentralized system of power in the city, what they would say is the main reason we should not change? And how do you answer those comments? I think the, the main argument of those who didn't want to see any change was that, hey, we're getting the job done. And, and we, the individual members of the elected city council, after all, represent the people. People in those wards uh, knew who their council member was or they couldn't know who that was and they could call them about anything. So there was this, the city council felt they were close to the people and they could, they could take care of that. And the city council uh, was most knowledgeable about the issues that were going on and hey, we had a process through our committees to address it. And so they really didn't see that you really needed to change this kind of thing because in spite of the argument you were making about a number of issues that would never been addressed or resolved and the disconnect between planning and implementation, I don't know that they really bought into that, but they really said, hey, we're doing a good job. We, had, we recognize there are problems with the, uh, the disparate uh, voices from various departments and we got problems with the delivery of some services and hey, we're trying to resolve that. And we've created this new office called the coordinator and that coordinator responds to us. Um, that was their argument, and that's that's what they said. Can I ask one more question? John Karen was next. Yeah, John? Hey, Clarence, when you did this, did the interviews for the committee, yeah, did you bring anybody in from the union movement in Minneapolis? You know, I don't see that in the report. I mean, I, I think we were aware of it, particularly the CIO, um, but not specifically. Well, the Central Labor Union in Minneapolis was the dominant. Right. Really, the police and fire have emerged since as the dominant. When I talked with people about this, Dick Curtin and I talked with a number of people, it became very clear that the unions will, would never approve the charter change. And that's true today. And that is because they would much prefer when they negotiate their contracts to be able to go one on one with council members who would be thinking only about the employee contracts instead of going being in the negotiations with the mayor who had many other interests to sort out and would compromise. And that remains true today. And I don't know if anybody's even begun thinking about how to engage the union leadership in Minneapolis, but the public employees unions have been very opposed to this for years. Well, oh, Pat, did you have a follow up question? Where was, when did Wayne Thompson come into Minneapolis? What, what would, during, Wayne, was, was Wayne he, Thompson was the public affairs director of the Dayton Hudson Corporation. And he had really become, as I recall, a fairly uh, active publicly with a number of ideas uh, prior to the creation of this uh, committee. We were aware of his interests um, and you could see them uh, displayed in the campus papers. Uh, he had proposals for uh, building a, uh, a, a subway system, which the first city coordinator, uh, who was from the public works department, thought was a great idea. <laughs> we were aware of that. Uh, it hadn't caught fire and people had done it, but hey, we knew what that was going on. But he was a figure of some consequence. Uh, among the business community in Minneapolis. Yeah. It said, I think Ted or Paul can speak to some of this other, who, who was around this organization called the Citizens League that we, uh, we knew, we consulted with, we talked with, uh, what the nature of those conversations were. Um, the committee as such uh, brought in, as I said, speakers. You can see who it 
was that we brought in. And the very back, we listed all the people who we brought in to address the committee. Uh, most of them were involved in this planning function because that was what the, the board had said we were supposed to function. We were supposed to address the question. But we had said, okay, it's not just a planning set of questions. It's also this question of implementation, the connection between planning and implementation that got us directly into the question of how is the city organized to make decisions? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what drove us to talk about structure really as the answer to uh, the problem of the disconnects that existed. I have Dana and then Paul next, Paul Ostro. Hi, um, I am wondering uh, about a little more information about the city coordinator. Um, at the time of the Citizens League study, am I understanding that the coordinator was approved, was uh, hired more or less uh, by the city council, appointed by the city council? Right, right. Okay, and that's still the case today? There is no coordinator today. There's no coordinator? No, there, no, there is a city coordinator. No, there is a city coordinator today, and that that city coordinator is appointed by the city council. Okay. But reports today, I think, is the way I hear it today, that coordinator reports to both the city council and the mayor. But I think that goes through the executive committee with Correct. the mayor making the first recommendation. Right, that's the first, that's another later development that didn't happen at this period. But the city coordinator, actually the city, the position of city coordinator, the city council thought was important and they went to the legislature and the legislature adopted legislation that changed the city charter organization to create the position called city coordinator. So it was there and, and it was important. I mean, it was beginning to try to pull together some of this stuff. Well, um, I know I uh, spent a summer in 1972 as uh, an intern at the Minneapolis Planning Department and Tommy Thompson who was the co city coordinator at the time right. was very, at least, in my observation, very powerful and ah. uh, put out a report during that summer about the subway under downtown and, you know, much uh, hoopla about that. Today, I couldn't tell you who the city coordinator is. <laughs> is there, has there been a lessening of power by that person or am I just out of touch? I don't know. <laughs> My sense is that the office of the city coordinator is is functioned more more like a city administrator. I hesitate to say that because it doesn't have uh, control, for example, over the department heads. The department heads are still appointed, but in the case of the mayor, the police is police, police chief is appointed by the mayor. All the other department heads are appointed by the city council. Now they come up through this executive committee process uh, that John and others can probably explain better than I, but nevertheless, they are appointed by the city council. However, the city coordinator is given jobs to do, is asked by the city council and the mayor to look at various questions. Uh, it's, uh, it has some real responsibility for functions. It's the building inspector operation, uh, which is in it. Um, all the questions around city buildings uh, it's the one that came up with the proposal to build this now new building that's going up on 5th and 4th Street. Um, uh, it has a fair amount to say about the budget. It makes recommendations to the budget. It's not visible in the sense that it's reporting to the city or to the citizens, but it clearly reports to and is quite important to building the city budget, to the finances of the city, to uh, the dialogue about what we're doing, what we should or shouldn't be doing. But it's not as visible as yeah. it was maybe back in the time of, uh, of uh, Tommy Thompson. Yeah, okay. Paul Astro. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry for my sporadic involvement this morning, but uh, just if I could make a quick comment about the city coordinator, I think uh, Lyle Schwarzkopf was thought of as a pretty powerful uh, and influential city coordinator when we recently had a group of us speak with mm -hmm. the Charter Commission. Kathleen O'Brien was mentioned as someone who mm -hmm. uh, wielded a lot of influence at City Hall. Um, when I started with Mayor Ryback during the time I was council president, John Moyer was city coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, John Moyer became increasingly frustrated. Uh, I think he would have said that and did say that publicly uh, with the, the city coordinator position is essentially um, supervises uh, human resources, IGR, finance, regulatory services. There are a number of different functions of the city. Most of them are, um, how do I put it? They're more global functions of the city. Obviously finance, HR, IGR, they reflect every, every organization of the city is impacted by those. And technically the city coordinator's authority is as their boss, essentially. Um, but what did happen over time was that certain city coordinators were able to develop enough loyalty among council members and staff that they ended up convening department heads and kind of serving as maybe a de facto city administrator, but they never really had that authority. Right. And when they tried to assert that discipline, I would argue John Moyer, chief among them, there was all sorts of pushback. Um, and so I think that position has been reduced in its influence because it really, it, it's an influence that is only influenced based on the consent of both the elected officials and the other department heads. It's, it's, it's not anything that is, is it, it, there's no inherent authority of that city coordinator, for example, over the, the head of MCD, you know, the, the formerly MCDA or the, the now currently the planning department or, or transportation, but there's no, so, um, that rudder, in my opinion, has really been been lost, and I'm not sure we can assume in the future that the mere force of personality or gentlewomen and gentlemen's agreement to accept that leadership is really gonna gonna work. Uh, my question, and I apologize if it's already been addressed, uh, is kind of where this landed and what happened when I'll the report that, was done. I'll track to that in just a second. Yeah. Okay, that, that's uh, it. Question. Yeah, just uh, you know, what did the council engage in it? Did the charter commission engage in it? Did the right, legislature I'll, command? I'll talk about that in a second. Great, I'll but that's it. it. And yeah, I'll listen as much as I can. Um, okay. And I really appreciate the report, Clarence. Thank you. Okay, Clarence. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, all right. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we're out of questions. We're out of questions, all right. So. The final uh, review I'd make is this issue of implementation. So what happens? The league adopts the report. The committee adopts it, sends it to the board of the Citizens League. They discussed it and they said, yes, we'll adopt it as an official uh, policy or official uh, position of the Citizens League. The Citizens League in its history uh, not only adopted the reports sometimes rejected, but most often adopted the reports of its committees. But it also had a process for implementing it. What are we gonna do now that we've, we've said this is ours? What are we gonna do to make sure it gets done? How are we gonna implement it? And it never hesitated as an example to go to the legislature if that's the group to which it was directed. However, this report, and you'll note on page 37, was not directed to the city planner, to the city charter commission. It was directed to both the city council and to the state legislature with the hope that both of them would adopt its recommendations. It observed on pages 35 and 36 that, hey, the city had gone to the legislature for many changes affecting the city charter, example, including this office of the coordinator, as well as many other numerous issues in 1963, 1965, and 1967 sessions. They even had a committee in the legislature dealing with city requests. So 
it was routinely done this way. The, the, the city understood that local government really is the creature of the state. The state is the one that sets up the, the format, the arrangement, arrangement of powers at the local level. But the city doesn't hesitate to say, hey, we can change things. Even though we now have since 1920, a quote, home rule charter, we could also go to the legislature and get any other changes that we needed to have made to the way we were doing business. So the Citizens League said, well, then if you're gonna do that, this is an opportune time to go to, to have the city council endorse these proposed changes and then to go to the legislature to get them done. I don't recall the specific steps that we took with the legislature. I think Ted might be able to provide some insight on that, but nevertheless, many of the recommendations except for the merger of this office of presidents and mayor of the, the, the president's city council and mayor, many of them were adopted over time. The, the Citizens League continued to work with people on the city council and said, hey, how about this? Couldn't we just at least do this? And we can see the result of those discussions emerging in a set of charter proposals that were made to the people uh, that two of which, two of the three, which passed the electorate. One of them in, um, uh, that increased the um, mayor's veto power over all actions of the city council, except those relating to its own organization and rules, was adopted. We went to the people and it was adopted in 1974. And another one in 1976 that increased responsibility of the mayor to include city planning and preparation of the city budget. As I indicated though, the city charter proposal to transfer from the council to the mayor, the duties and responsibilities of preparing the budget and then increasing the mayor's staff, it lost. It, it, it won the majority vote, but there was an extraordinary vote that it had to have and it lost because of that extraordinary vote. So there was implementation done, the city council understood and agreed that, hey, there were some problems and hey, we could fix them and we needed to address them and we needed to get all of our actions up to, this, to the mayor. So they began to do that and then they began to say, let's make that a change in the city charter. The next big evolution that occurred as John Carnes uh, noted was this creation of the executive committee I'm not as familiar with the details of that, but it, as I understood it, it basically consisted of the mayor, the, the uh, city coordinator, the president of the city council, and a couple of other leaders of the city council who came together routinely to handle uh, the appointments of city department heads. Uh, and I think even some policy matters went through them in the process. I'm not, as I said, particularly familiar with what happened in the 70s and the evolution of that executive committee, but the executive committee is still a part of the fabric of how, uh, how decisions get made in Minneapolis. The question of the spokesperson for the city, it remains divided. The city council approves its legislative program and it goes over in lobbies. They hire a lobbyist for the city of Minneapolis. Uh, the mayor's aware of that, but the mayor isn't the primary spokesperson, uh, can be, but there is some competition between the office of the mayor and the office of the uh, president of the city council in providing leadership. We saw in the last year, the leader of the city council, the, the, uh, <laughs> who, who basically said, I really want to take leadership for the planning process. And I've got a lot of ideas about how to densify development in the city uh, to, uh, uh, change the zoning code to um, uh, increase the population of the city. Um, so there's a real contest that goes on still between these two leadership roles, the president of the city council and the mayor. Mm -hmm. So that's as much as I know about the implementation of this. We never merged the two, but we did do some things to uh, to recognize the other ideas in the proposals and they were adopted. The, mayor, sure. the coordinator is not on the executive committee. It's only okay. the mayor, 
the president of the city council and three other council members. Right. Okay. right. They're selected by the council, not by the mayor. Right. One other point, uh, it's just a off the wall point, but Lyle Schwarzkopf was actually the city clerk. He was hired when I was on, was president of the council. Right. And right. He, he was, we hired him because we wanted him to be the chief lobbyist for the city. And he did a phenomenal job. He was very competent, did a great job. And he was an outstanding uh, senior officer in the city. And I think the executive committee uh, was passed in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think when Fraser was mayor. Now that's got. I've, I've looked at some of the inf the information that the charter commission is working on now. It's it's terribly active. I'm absolutely amazed. I don't know that I've ever remembered the city charter commission uh, engaging in as many meetings as it is right now. Uh, wow. It it has put together. I would say you know there are like 15 different uh, reports that it's looked at relative to this question of the of the roles, responsibilities of leaders of the city. And uh, it's identified certain issues that it wants to, uh, certain suggestions for things to change. And uh, this committee of the Charter Commission apparently is going to report, I've heard, maybe sometime in March or April. Uh, and there seems to be some um, who think that this, out of this activity, <laughs> Uh, we're going to see a uh, significant change in the charter, particularly as it involves uh, department heads. I think that seems to be one of the issues right now. Who's appointing these department heads? Uh, some people, um, I talked to one of the council members and she felt that uh, part of the problem we've got today is the demands that are placed on department heads uh, by these 13 members of the city council individually and um, and the Charter Commission is trying to address that and they seem to be primarily looking at at uh, putting the mayor in charge of, of the departments, making the mayor the chief executive of the city. Uh, okay, has his hand up. And then John Adams. Paul. Paul? He's you're, trying, on, you're on mute. He's trying to find it. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead what, while we're waiting for Paul. Yeah, I'm on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Clarence, let's, let's say that the key issue here, before we talk about whether it really ought to be implemented, the 69 report, what's the step that has to be taken to get it on the table in front of the Charter Commission? What has to happen for that to occur? I'm assuming you have to be invited or you have to ask the uh, study committee of the Charter Commission, hey, can we make a presentation on this idea of how to address uh, the thing? One of the, one of the questions I've had looking at the material of the Charter Commission, I'm having, it, it's, it's, I think it's there, but it isn't obvious what the quote problems are that they're trying to resolve. Uh, this problem definition, I think is fairly critical. Uh, because then you can focus the discussion if you have some agreement on what the issues are. Uh, you need to document it. But I mean, they, they have interviewed all of the, all the department heads and the past coordinators. Uh, so they've got some documentation of hey, issues that seen through the eyes of those people. Um, but I'm not quite sure what the Charter Commission, its study committee, has concluded is the problem that needs to be addressed right now in the way we structure that government. But in any case, somebody's got to go to the Charter Commission and say, here's a, an idea about how that question could be addressed. So I think we should submit this recording to the Charter Commission. I know they're doing a lot of reading and gathering of information. Uh, this has been a great summary of, of that whole uh, earlier period and um, as well as some of the ideas of the members. So I, I would suggest, Janice, that maybe this be submitted to the Charter Commission as, as an additional document, so to speak. John Adams? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Clarence, you did mention uh, 
What is the problem that reorganizing city government, uh, can you hear me, am I on? Yeah, you're on, yeah. on. Yeah. Um, what, what exactly are the set of problems that reorganizing city government would help resolve? If you're gonna bring this to the voters at some point, the voters are gonna to have to be tuned in on, yes, if we vote for this, things are gonna be taken care of in a better way than they're being taken care of now. Right. And it, has, it occurs to me that over the years, the politically active people in the city uh, are actually much more interested in very local things which they take to their city council members to deal with than they are interested in larger questions about the role of the city itself in an expanding metropolitan area in an increasingly complex state of affairs for the state. You know, in addition to the fact that there's almost no press coverage, widespread press coverage of these issues that would tune in local voters on the issue itself, what are the problems that remodeling city government would help us resolve other than these theoretical issues that some people are taken with, but don't have much resonance with the average voter? Is there any widespread unhappiness in the city on the part of active voters about what's wrong that changing city government would help fix? Yes. Yes. Go what? Ahead. Go ahead, Pat. <laughs> yeah, what are the top three? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Pat. <laughs> I hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is that, that part of what the city charter commission is dealing with is that it was requested by a supermajority of the city council to uh, change the uh, decision that had been made, I forget, I don't have, I have the date here, but change the decision that was made in the city charter to have a specific number of police per thousand population. And the city council said, get rid of that provision. And the city charter commission said, hey, we're not going to do that. We are okay. currently now going to undertake a larger discussion. So okay. in, in part okay. of the question. On the police, the police thing is a pretty good example, but if you've made that number one, what's number two? Good question. So I, I would say, I would say number two is the way in which the city's financed. Okay, that's we good. To, we, we have to get off the property tax and get more sales tax and income tax coming in. That's good, that's very good. Yeah. I, I think Thank you, Mr. A, Professor. I think there's <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I think there's a widespread unhappiness with the uh, rampant, uh, I would argue, not particularly well thought out development of the city. Um, I think there's extreme unhappiness with the almost total disregard of the neighborhood planning process. Um, I think there's a sense that either developers or advocates uh, are really running the development decisions in the city rather than the people that actually live in the neighborhoods of the city. Uh, I suspect that Pat might agree with me on that. Well, one example of that is the issue of the Upper Harbor. Uh, the, upper no. harbor yes. the Upper Harbor is a situation where the city acquired many acres of land uh, where uh, Dowling Avenue, 38th Avenue North hits the river, it acquired all this river frontage, uh, primarily to fill barges that would at least use the investment the federal government had made at the urging of uh, our, our ex-mayor, Hubert Humphrey, to build this large lock and dam uh, to enable barge traffic to get up to uh, the upper part of the river in Minneapolis. And we then created this uh, area where there could be some uh, activities to fill barges. And then we would be noted on uh, all kinds of atlases as the headwaters, the head beginning point of navigation down the Mississippi River. <coughs> uh, but we had all this land and frankly, many of the activities that occupied the land were obsolete. And uh, the city said, oh, we got we, we to get rid of these activities and we got to re, redo the land. Now the question was, well, what's going to go there? Uh, there's real 
real issues here. Uh, <laughs> they have a proposal from, of all places, uh, First Avenue, this entertainment complex in downtown Minneapolis that says, as do many other advocates, hey, we need an outdoor amphitheater for uh, bands and other activities for the summer. Uh, many other cities have these outdoor amphitheaters. We need one, and hey, it would be great to have it there. Um, others were saying in the adjoining community of North Minneapolis, hey, our incomes in North Minneapolis are the lowest in this entire city. It's an area of concentrated African Americans with very low incomes, a high unemployment rates, uh, low scores on all kinds of statewide uh, tests of grade school, middle school, and high school. Uh, people are saying, well, why isn't, why don't we develop jobs in this now Upper Harbor area? And the city is kind of caught between these competing visions. Uh, and it never really comes to resolve what is the vision we should have. It tries to accommodate the increasing vocalization from the community that says, oh, look, we need jobs. And they said, well, you know, we'll see what we can do. We kind of understand that building the amphitheater is going to provide some part-time jobs, hauling beer and other kinds of things uh, for the summer. That's not much of a job opportunity, but hey, that's a great idea for other reasons. And they try to suggest that maybe we can do something yeah. to provide some of the land for, for permanent uh, living wage jobs. But it's an illustration of the real controversy around part of the development of the Minneapolis. Ed. That is so, oh. Well, I'm just saying this is an illustration. Can, can I make a comment on that, Clarence? Yeah. Okay, uh, Clarence, you, you outlined UHT very interestingly. John has brought up the issue of what do the citizens want? And earlier in this meeting, someone pointed out that the unions, you know, have some problems in terms of their wanting to get things for their people. And the, in order to get this passed, the citizens have to vote on it and they have to see it to their advantage. Yep. The issue of Upper Harbor, we could spend some a lot of time on, as you know, but the amphitheater was not a citizen's driven choice. It was driven by a council person and First Avenue for their own pre pre preference. And the city in the planning department had to twist the proposal to the state for the grant in order to get the money that would eventually go into First Avenue's plans for that, that operation. So the citizens have not had a voice in this and they don't see that. So why, you know, it continues to be at a failure of anything that's put before the citizens to be turned down because they don't see it to their advantage. I think you and I have talked about it. You and I and Paul have talked about it and other people and John has just talked about it again. So regardless of the efforts to create the dissension and problems that, that the, the city it has in itself, it needs to look at how it's going to address those issues that the citizens want. Uh, John mentioned the, the citizens again, the 2040 plan, the disenfranchising of the neighborhoods in terms of the, the uh, NRP program. Constantly, the citizens are being disenfranchised on almost every decision that's being made while the city government wrangles amongst itself as to the structure that it should have in order not to have to deal with the city citizens. So where do you take that? Lee, Lee, can I make a comment? Yes, Ted, go ahead. Put me, put me in line, whatever. Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, you're next. <laughs> I think you're next. Well, I could, I could be uh, very mistaken, but hello there. Uh, I could be very mistaken, but uh, I would guess that the discussions going on uh, in the Charter Commission uh, are 
entirely about uh, uh, solving the problems of the management and oversight of the police. Uh, I, I just really wanted to add, uh, and I, I would think that um, that's the major driver for any kind of change. And uh, it would be good to concentrate on that and secondarily on, or on some of these other questions. Let me add just one thing to that little note I wrote um, that I think Janice sent around late yesterday. Yeah. Um, my, my sense of the Minneapolis city government is that it was, a, John Adams and I had some conversation about this, that it was an old English borough form um, with the councilors elected by wards and um, the leader being the person elected by the majority uh, group of the councilors. Uh, the British uh, haven't had the institution of uh, mayor. Um, we had an institute, an, the office of mayor was added by statute early uh, into the Minneapolis government system when uh, city government uh, was structured statutorily. So we had this funny combination of the uh, council system, the strong council system and a strong mayor responsible only for the one uh, major function of uh, appointment of the chief of police and the oversight of the department. Uh, I could be mistaken, but my guess is that uh, um, uh, individuals and interests, uh, wealth and property in uh, Minneapolis in those years uh, ensured that the governmental structure provided for uh, the preservation of law and order to be uh, under the supervision jurisdiction of a person elected citywide. Uh, uh, in which election they'd have the most uh, influence. And that's, uh, that's I think, what's uh, at the heart of the discussion right now. And it would see, seem to me that any talk about, not to necessarily diminish the importance of some of the management and development uh, issues, I think the central question in people's mind today is probably the uh, solving of this problem about the... Um, oversight of the police. I'd suggest um, if you want to pursue this a little bit, talk to Ed Dirkswager, who was deputy mayor when Fraser uh, brought in uh, Tony Boza uh, to, um, uh, to be chief of police in uh, Minneapolis. And uh, Ed has uh, some very astute, uh, I've had a number of conversations with him about this. Um, he has some very, I think, sensible, practical uh, observations about uh, this relationship uh, and the difficulty that the city government structure in Minneapolis creates for the uh, ability of a chief to have enough continuity and authority in office to discipline the bad actors in the force. Uh, Ed has some con comments also about the, um, I won't try to quote him, but you should ask him about his uh, sense of the various kinds of uh, uh, amendments uh, the, to the uh, city charter and the, over the appointment of officials and so forth, the executive committee made, uh, uh, you know, starting I think on Hofstede's time and continuing in a principal way in uh, Fraser's time. That's all I was gonna say. But I, and I'd be interested in any comments you have on that. Maybe Pat there has. <laughs> Yeah, were you trying to say something? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Am I muted? No, oh, you're on. Oh, good. Thank you, Lee. Um, I can't figure out exactly where we are right now. I mean, I, what, what is really interesting to me is how things get defeated. And John Cairns is right. You have to have the unions on your side, although the unions are not as strong as the CLU used to be. And the police union certainly isn't. But the other question is, as soon as you propose something to the citizens of, Minas of Minneapolis, if you say, this is going to raise your guys' taxes, it's not going to fly. And so all the permutations of everything that you're talking about depends on its saleability, it seems to me. And you have to have stronger organizations behind it than we currently have existing behind any reform, I think. 
Um, I mean, that is how it gets beat. And you can, and the city, and, and today, John is again, absolutely right. It, there's a proposal before the council this morning to abolish again, the police department and disperse its responsibilities. God knows where, but you know, we have to be realistic, I think, and I'm not really sure that we are being, and that's all I want to say. The other, the other we're, thing. Uh, we're almost out of time here. So what, Clarence, do you want to? Sure, just a short can, can I, about how things may have changed since 1969, otherwise. In 1969, we had active attention to all this discussion by the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Reporters were assigned full time to City Hall. They did reports routinely in the city paper all about what's going on in City Hall. That function is minimal these days. There are no community newspapers that cover this stuff anymore. So the communication of, of what's going on in City Hall is much reduced from what it was in 69. Um, the second thing that I think has changed, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but I think it, the involvement on the part of leading people in the legal firms of the city, in the businesses of the city uh, has changed. Uh, many of those corporations are no longer in the city and those that are don't seem to be in systematically engaged at the level of somebody who's a vice president or somebody who's involved in public affairs. So it's gonna be difficult to get the attention of these folks if they're important to uh, engaging in a resolution of these kinds of questions. Even the question of the police department. The final comment I would make is that in dealing with the quote police department as an issue, you have a situation right now where the city council and the mayor are in the middle of negotiations with that police union. And they have been for the last 40 years systematically approving contracts with the police union. And they've approved them routinely. And if it's in those contracts that part of the problem is, the question is how is the city council and the mayor going to begin to address what it is they're asking for in the changes to that set of agreements. We're not seeing that. We don't know anything about it. And I don't know if any change is going to come in the context of that set of negotiations. Right. Thank you very much, Clarence. Um, yeah. Are there any, uh, Janice, are there any final things we need to discuss before we uh, conclude this session? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, however. OK, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK. <laughs> Yeah, actually, what I had my hand raised for much of what Clarence just said, um, but I'm I'm just wondering if something gets you know comes out of the Charter Commission and and gets placed on the ballot, you know, how to communicate that to the voters? I mean, with with something as much attention as Minneapolis has had, we're bound to get attention on this charter change, and it's going to get turned into sound bites, and you know, but that's that's a whole other topic. So thank you, Clarence. Or wow, what a what a I hope people listen and and take a look at that report and give it some thought.